for the Susan Taylor Podcast, where we discuss the yoga of mind, medicine, and healing. Author of Feeling Good Matters, Sexual Radiance, and the Vital Energy Program, Dr. Taylor imparts authentic knowledge and practical tools that inspire, educate, and empower us to be a healing force for positive change. So join us and take your life and our planet to the next level. Hello and welcome to Episode 8, Can the Sun Make You Happier? Today we'll take a closer look at vitamin D, the sun hormone. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the science behind the vitamin D connection to our gut-brain axis, also talk about the role of vitamin D in gut health, and we'll talk about the connection between vitamin D to support our brain. And we'll end with some important takeaways on what we can do in our practical life. So I'm really looking forward to speaking on these great topics, and let's get started. You remember last time we talked about our gut-brain axis, and I mentioned the trillions of bacterial cells that lie just behind our gut lining help to support our immune function, as well as our mental states, because those bacteria actually communicate directly with our brain and our nervous system. And I also mentioned about the scientific breakthroughs demonstrating that the cells, our bacteria cells in our gut, called our gut microbiome, can affect how we deal with stress and our anxiety levels, as well as how our brain is going to keep functioning throughout life. So knowing that connection between our gut and our feelings gave us strategies to manage and care for this kind of connection that we have. So today I'm going to turn to a wonderful source to nourish and support our gut-brain axis, and I'm going to talk about vitamin D. So what is vitamin D? And then I'll get into what are the benefits for the gut-brain axis. But before really getting into the gut-brain axis, let's clarify whether vitamin D is a hormone, which it sometimes is referred to, or a vitamin. Well, we define a vitamin as a substance that's needed in the diet because the body can't make it. So is vitamin D really a vitamin? I mean, our body does make it. Well, maybe in the winter time we don't have as much, so we can say it's a vitamin maybe in the winter. But perhaps we can look at it as a hormone. And a hormone is classified as something that is formed in one organ and is transported in the blood to another organ. And that organ is a target organ, which activates whatever uh, uh, hormone or substance will be in that target organ. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is because some people say it's a vitamin, some people say it's a hormone. So to keep everyone happy, why don't we call it a vita hormone? And that's only a made up word. That's no scientific word, but we'll call it a vita hormone because it can be a vitamin. It can be looked at as a hormone. So in the very strict sense, it plays many, many roles. So hopefully people will be satisfied about a vita hormone. So let's move on. Do you remember when you were taught about vitamin D in school, that it's a vitamin and it's good for your bones? Well, I know I was, and you probably were too, but that gives it a very limited range because it's also a compound that when it's activated by the UVB, B as in boy, raised by the sun, it creates a biochemical reaction that converts it to an active compound. And what that does is it activates 900 genes. And what I'm talking about here is our DNA. So it's a very, very powerful vital hormone, as I just mentioned, because it's actually activating 900 genes. So it's not just for our bones, it's many, many other uh, uh, mechanisms that are taking place within our body. Today, I'll just discuss a few of them because it's such a vast area of research. So the body makes most of its vitamin D that it needs. It makes it. And by definition, as I said, it might not be a vitamin. It might be because only 10% comes from our food. The action of the, UB, uh, the UVB rays of the sunlight on the skin is what produces the uh, conversion, not the UVA. And I might mention it again later, UVA, that's when you sit in front of the sun through the window, say in your car, or it, if you have large windows in your home, you're not getting UVB rays. So it's the UVB rays that you need to get in order to have that conversion. So what happens is 
those rays of sunlight, uh, they hit our skin, and the skin produces a substance called D2, cholecalciferol, which is converted to the liver. It's converted in the liver to calcidiol. And then this is further converted in the kidneys by an enzyme, 1 alpha hydroxylase to D3, calcitrol. This is the active form of vitamin D known as D3. And that's the cal the calcidiol is what's considered uh, the good indicator of our vitamin D levels, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And that's what's measured by uh, when you go in and get your blood work taken and your red blood cells. So what makes vitamin D so unique compared to other vitamins is that when your body gets it, it turns it into a hormone-like compound. And I just wanted to give a little bit of the background in the conversion for those that might be interested. Especially when people ask, well, does the sun give us the vitamin D? Well, the sun doesn't provide the vitamin D directly, as I just mentioned. Standing in the sun for a couple of minutes every day helps your body meet some of its needs for the vitamin because the sun triggers the first of those three chemical reactions that actually converts the inactive compound in the skin to an active vitamin D. So you can see even how the health of your skin will matter. Again, Here's how it works real specifically. The ultraviolet B rays from the sun convert a natural vitamin D precursor called dehydrocholesterol. You see, we need cholesterol in our body in order to have this happen, and that's present in our skin. So 7-dehydrocholesterol goes into vitamin D3, it's converted. And this travels to the liver where an, an addition of oxygen and hydrogen makes the vitamin D3 change to what we call 25-hydroxyvitamin D. And doctors test for this intermediate and still active form of D in the red blood cells to determine our vitamin D status. So the final activation of the 25-hydroxy vitamin D takes place in the kidneys. So again, there's another organ involved where more oxygen and hydrogen molecules attach to this a molecule and convert it to its active form, which is called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, or cal calcitriol. So that's very important in the sense if you want to know what form to take, and I'll mention that later, or I'll mention it right now for those that might have want to know it now. That's why when we take in vitamin D3, it's much more absorbable than vitamin, two, uh, vitamin D2. So if you're fair skinned, talking about the skin where I said the dehydrocholesterol that's present in our skin gets converted, experts say that if you're fair skinned and you go outside for 10 minutes in midday sun, you know, with shorts and a tank top, with no sunscreen, that gives you enough radiation to produce about 10,000 what we call IUs, which are international units of the vitamin. Dark-skinned individuals and the elderly also produce less vitamin D. And that's not surprising because the skin has more of a barrier and doesn't let the UVB rays come through. So many folks don't get enough of this nutrient from our dietary sources. And we don't get enough if we live in uh, northern climates or if our skin tends to be darker. So that's why people talk about fortifying it. Just keep in mind that vitamin D is essential to every cell in the body, and it was never meant to be in food. But again, as uh, technology improves and we have more sophistication, then we learn to start taking it, and that's when it got supplemented in, in milk. But in milk, you're only getting maybe 100 IUs in a cup, so you'd have to, to get that, you'd have to you know, drink, what, 100 cups of milk a day to get what you would get in the sun. So vitamin D has many roles. Besides enabling normal mineralization of bones, which we learned and I talked about, mentioned earlier on, vitamin D modulates cell growth, it supports our immune system, and it also has been shown to reduce inflammation. There was a study done at the University of uh, North Carolina, and they showed that actually vitamin D plays a very important role in digestion. Because cells in our digestive system have vitamin D receptors called VDR receptors, and they're needed for protein synthesis. So these vitamin D receptors are found on the surface of a cell, and what they do is they receive uh, signals, chemical signals. And by attaching themselves these signals to a receptor, these chemical signals uh, direct a cell to do something. So that's the way it works. 
chemical comes in, gets a signal, and it sends another signal, and we have a cascade of reactions happening. And that really, that's what happens when our cells, uh, you know, react certain ways, divide or even die. So there are vitamin D receptors found on cells in the digestive tract and the immune system, which is embedded within the digestive tract. And vitamin D then can bind to these receptors. And the most common symptoms of vitamin D deficiency when there's some blockage in receptors, let's say, for example, include rickets, osteoporosis, or skeletal deformities. And this information, if anybody wants to look further, is, um, is seen on the Office of Dietary Supplements. So vitamin D does uh, also play a role, research shows, in preventing prostate, colon, breast cancers. And it may also contribute to the prevention of diabetes, glucose intolerance due to the insulin receptors and hypertension. But what was most fascinating to me and why I'm bringing it up in this podcast is because last time we spoke about, do you have the guts to be happy? But I was pretty interested when I heard that it helps keep the integrity of the gut lining. Now, remember the gut lining has the microbiome and it's also uh, benefiting our immune system. So what it does and research shows that it, vitamin D will increase diversity and help with maintaining the integrity of this lining. Remember, the lining of the gut has tight junctions, as I've mentioned in blogs, as well as the podcast, and we want to keep them very tight. So vitamin D may be actually a compound, not the whole picture, but help by working with barrier function. So keeping those tight junctions nice and sealed and not letting the leaky gut syndrome uh, take over. So let's turn a little bit to vitamin D benefiting our brain and what's the science. I always like to look at the science before giving you the practices or what can we take away from this. But scientific literature has found that low levels of vitamin D correlate with Parkinson's disease, MS, Alzheimer's, any uh, dementia, which is very, very fascinating new research. So we have to ask ourselves, though, what's the relationship all about? Is it actually the brain? Is it actually going to the brain? Or is it the gut communicating with the brain, as we discovered in our last podcast? So that communication is crucial. And that's where people are speculating the issue is or the benefit is with vitamin D. So it does regulate the gut, according to some research. So there was a study done in 2014 with the presence of vitamin D in lab animals, which I'm not an advocate of, giving a chemical, a poison, uh, and they became resistant. Uh, The poison causes inflammation. And when they were given vitamin D, which was so fascinating, even though they were given the poison, they were resistant to inflammation. So... Vitamin D, we can talk about it, it does have a benefit on inflammation and inflammatory processes are what cause some of the brain problems uh, that we're seeing now. Vitamin D is also important for the brain because of its importance in regulating and maintaining diversity in the gut. So it helps with the gut not breaking down. And diversity, there's not too many things to really prove one way or another if it's helpful, but just common sense Uh, It allows me to say something where when we have diversity in our microbiome rather than just a very linear way, I think the diversity will give us more of a spectrum to help ourselves stay healthy. So as I mentioned, vitamin D activates 900 genes, that means our DNA, so it may help in preventing cancer, I said inflammation already, and cognitive issues like dementia and Alzheimer's. Remember, I spoke about cholesterol. Cholesterol is very important because it's a chemical that's needed for the body to convert uh, the sun. The sun converts um, the compound into uh, vitamin D, which is the active chemical that we need. It's the very chemical, it's the very compound, I should say, not chemical, cholesterol, that we're constantly trying to lower and lower and lower. So research also shows that vitamin D helps the brain clear debris, build up plaque. A new animal study from Japan suggested that vitamin D may help clear the brain of amyloid beta, which is a toxic protein 
uh, like compound that accumulates in the brains of Alzheimer's, pa uh, Alzheimer's patients. So again, they're doing all this in uh, animal studies, which uh, they can't uh, do legally, I believe, in humans. It's clearly invasive. Uh, but what we can see is that uh, the this study did validate the results of a previous study that was done in in uh, human Alzheimer's patients, and what they did in the human study they put vitamin D together with curcumin, uh, that's the active ingredient which they've isolated out of turmeric, and it appeared to stimulate the immune system in a way that helped clear the brain of this toxic amyloid beta. Now, curcumin. Uh, I'd like to just, the turmeric spice is uh, healing in and of itself. So they concluded that it was vitamin D alone may be, may do the job nicely, but I would suggest perhaps not. I don't quite know, uh, but they're trying to say that vitamin D alone can do that because turmeric is very, very uh, anti-inflammatory as many of you probably already know. So they did show, though, that in the animal model, that the amyloid beta buildup, again, that's what causes the blockage in the brain of Alzheimer's patients, literally was uh, being cleared out overnight. So that's pretty uh, potent to say that a vitamin can actually do that. So it may be somewhat um, uh, connected to the regulation of the transporter proteins that actually get rid of the... Uh, amyloid beta across the blood-brain barrier and out of the brain. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Vitamin D also affects intestinal bacteria and the production of B vitamins, which, what does that mean? B vitamins are used to synthesize our neurotransmitters, or the main ones being GABA, dopamine, serotonin. And again, they're in the gut as well as in the brain, but again, they do not cross the blood-brain barrier. So, uh, manufacture in the gut, what happens is it uses, it's, it's utilized for other organ systems, but it also then can transfer certain compounds through the blood-brain barrier to help with that too. So vitamin D deficiency uh, leads a change in our intestinal bacteria populations. And this is just one that make us, that supply us with eight B vitamins. And the B vitamins don't come from food. That's why they're vitamins. Remember I said vitamins are some substances that must come from food. So they always need to be supplied in daily doses through our food or in a supplement. And uh, they're needed by uh, the bacteria that we carry in our uh, intestines. So Healthy bacteria need our vitamin D to thrive so that when we don't have enough to pass down to the bacteria, they die off. They're, they're replaced then with unhealthy bacteria, and the unhealthy bacteria don't make the B vitamins that we need. That was the big problem with glyphosate in the soil. Well, they say that, you know, Roundup Ready and all those chemicals in the soil, well, we don't have, uh, it's the shikimate pathway, we don't have that in our human body, but... The bacteria have that, or the, the fungi in the, in the soil have it, and they make B vitamins. So all of that gets transferred to our bacteria. It's, it's a chain reaction. So vitamin D deficiency usually exists along the side of B vitamin deficiencies also. So they go kind of hand in hand. So I've been talking about these deficiencies. What if you're deficient in vitamin D? Well, with regard to the GI tract, deficiency can affect you in many ways. Because I mentioned there are D receptors in our uh, GI tract, also in our salivary glands. Our teeth, we get more cavities if our D is low, which has been shown. Our esophageal sphincter and the stomach cells that make stomach acid. So when the stomach sphincter is weak and acid moves up into the esophagus, where it doesn't belong, by the way, that's called acid reflux, uh, there could be problems with that. So the D we make in our skin goes to the liver, then into bile, keeping the bile acids dissolved, preventing the formation of gallstones even. So gallbladder disease is probably related to low vitamin D. So because there are D receptors in the islet cells of the pancreas, again, that has to do with insulin, which make insulin, uh, not enough vitamin D may also contribute to the formation of diabetes. So Low D results in the change in our intestinal bacteria. And then again, we have, that's where we get our irritable bowel syndrome, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. So because they've shown studies when it's normal and healthy, 
um, there, that's not a problem. So we also have uh, working in the GI. We also have it working with our cortisol levels. So there's a lot that happens with vitamin D and also leading when we don't have enough of it to autoimmune disorders. So if you don't have the guts to be happy, especially during the winter months, if you find yourself feeling a little bit off when sunlight's not so available, you might want to get your, v, uh, your vitamin D levels checked. Uh, it's pretty important because you do need it to have the guts being happy. I know that uh, for myself, when I had had my levels done and they were very low, as soon as I upped the levels, uh, my whole mood changed. So here are a few things that we want to note, and you might want to jot them down or check out the blog that'll be coming. As we move fall into winter, as I said, it's a good time to have your vitamin D levels checked by a simple blood test, especially if you live in the Northeast where sun is not very uh, available. And uh, a normal blood test will register about 30 nanograms per ml. It was previously thought that 21 was okay, but now they're uh, recently saying maybe 30 uh, to 35 in, in, that's the forward thinking people. And they use these levels now. And with these levels, they've estimated that 1 billion people are deficient in vitamin D. Also note, so the first one is please get your vitamin D levels tested if you're feeling a little bit blue or blah or whatever. Then the second uh, thing to note is the healing properties of national, uh, natural sunlight can't penetrate glass. That's what I mentioned. Because glass allows the UVA to burn the skin and come through, but not the UVB that's needed to convert uh, the dehydrocholesterol on the skin. So you might have to go outside. You have to. If you're dark skinned, you may need uh, 25 times more exposure time than light skinned individual to produce the same amount of vitamin D. I know myself, I go out in the sun, I can stay out 25 times more exposure because I have a darker pigment in my skin. I'm not fair light skinned because fair light skinned, as I mentioned, only 10 minutes, they can get about 10 thousand I use a vitamin D with only, you know, a 10 minute exposure. When I was studying at Columbia Medical School, when I did my master's in nutrition, they used to say 12 minutes a day with just the hands, the top of the hands, not the palm, the, uh, the uh, upper surface and our face for 12 minutes would give us enough. But things have changed over the years because that was possibly what, 20 years ago. Your body cannot absorb calcium without enough vitamin D. So you can take all the calcium you want. It'll receive no benefit, but most supplements have the vitamin D. And vitamin D deficiency is not reversed immediately. Remember this. You're looking at months of sunlight or supplements before levels return to normal in most cases. Also, your kidneys and liver activate vitamin D. So if you have kidney disease or a weakness or a damaged liver, it's going to hinder the ability to activate vitamin D when needed. So keep that in mind. And more practical ideas are eating foods that naturally contain vitamin D. Remember, we want to go with vitamin D3, including, they come from animal sources. D2 comes from uh, plant sources. So of course, the animal sources are more easily uh, uh, taken up in the body. And there's studies to show that also, uh, that the benefit in the uptake is quite extensive compared to the, the non-animal uh, form. So how do you get that? Eggs, fatty fish, such as salmon, mackerel, and cod liver oil, they had always mentioned how come cod liver oil uh, works so well. Well, they had the vitamin D in there. So they ensure um, intake of amounts that are essential. And fortified foods are okay, such as milk and dairy products, but just make sure that it's not fortified with D2 because it really doesn't have as much of a significance. Soy milk breads, breakfast cereals. I don't advocate any of these, but I'm just mentioning that. Even orange juice, I think they've supplemented at this point. But again, check if it's vitamin D3 or vitamin D2. Also, another point, sunscreens. From the strongest to the weakest, they do keep the body from getting enough vitamin D by about 95%. 
So in light of this, there's a theory that more individuals are getting depressed these days because everyone uses sunscreen because we've all been feared into skin cancer. And many people do have skin cancer because of the ozone layers, etc. So just keep these things in mind. Exposure 10 minutes a day can be very, very healthy. And keep in mind that D3 cholecalciferol is more potent than D2 when it comes to raising R levels. And as I mentioned, there was a, a very good study that was done in the University of Sori where they showed fortified foods with D3 uh, actually uh, produced better results than those. They were twice as effective in raising the levels of vitamin, vitamin D in the body than the counterpart of D2. So just to keep that in mind. So as we move out of fall and into winter, it is a very good time. I'm telling you, have your levels checked. Simple blood test if you're finding any differences in how you feel. So that brings us to the end of this episode. And if you'd like to be notified weekly for the new podcast, please subscribe. The Susan Taylor podcast is available on your favorite uh, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or some people have called and asked in susantaylor.org. You can go right there, register or subscribe, and you can get the podcast delivered to you. Contact us at susantaylor.org if you have any questions, comments, or feedback. I've been getting several emails on some content of what people want to hear, so I'm going to start including that, and we'll have... uh, community driven content. So I look forward to that. I'd like to thank you for listening. And again, the Susan Taylor podcast does come out every week. So until next time, remain calm.